Hello and welcome to Quadriga. He's young, he's charismatic, and he refers to his base as a movement rather than a party. No, it's not Emmanuel Macron I'm referring to, but the even younger and distinctly more conservative Sebastian Kurz. In just five months, he reinvented a party that has been in government for 30 years, renaming it Sebastian Kurz List and borrowing anti-immigration rhetoric from Austria's hard right-wing populists. Their leader, Heinz-Christian Strache, was also a big winner in last Sunday's elections. Together, the two parties took nearly two-thirds of the vote. The election result is being called a tectonic shift abroad as well as in Austria. So is Austria's swing to the right a threat to Europe? That's the question I'll be discussing with my guests. It's a pleasure to welcome Ulrike Hermann. She is a journalist for Germany's Taz daily newspaper, and she says the swing to the right in Austria is not an exception, but the norm. All of Europe is shifting to the right. And with us as well is Frank Hoffmann. He is DW's Eastern Europe expert. And he says if Vienna positions itself as a right-wing populist force in Europe, Paris will respond with a stronger core Europe. Then the populists surrounding Viktor Orban in Central Eastern Europe in Hungary would be left behind. And finally, great to have Matthew Kanicic on the show once again. He has Austrian roots and is Politico's chief European correspondent. And he says, Austria's course is not a threat to Europe, but a threat to the vision of closer integration pushed by French President Macron and the EU Commission. So before we come to the implications for Europe as a whole, I'd like to talk a bit more about the causes of last week's election result. And Matthew Kanichig, let me start with you uh, as an Austrian. Mainstream parties have been governing together in a grand coalition in Austria for what seems to many voters to be a near eternity. So is this election result really about the issues or is it in essence a protest by a lot of voters who say we are tired of politics, political business as usual? I think that's definitely part of it. There's been a lot of frustration with the Grand Coalition in Austria, which, you, as you say, has been in power for quite a long time, for 10 years running, but really before that, for decades, most of the post-war period. And what that has led to is a lot of clientelistic policies in Austria with the two dominant parties, the People's Party and the Social Democrats, dividing up a lot of the spoils between them. And that starts in public housing, for example, but really goes through every part of public life. It includes the public television stations. A lot of these positions have traditionally been divvied up between the new two main parties. And so then you have this populist party come in, the Freedom Party, and say, we want to really end these corrupt practices. We want to create a level playing field. So that has definitely been a very potent issue for them traditionally. But the other issue, which might have been more powerful this time, is the question of foreigners, of refugees, how to deal with that, and in particular, how to deal with Islam. And uh, this is something thing that really gets a lot of Austrians blood boiling is the question of what they call Islamization or this fear that the society is becoming uh, Islamicized. So I want to come back to that issue in just a moment but Frank Hoffman when we're talking about other factors that may have influenced the result to what degree would you put this down also to personal uh, issues. Sebastian Kurz as a figure, he kind of represents a new model of European politician uh, along the lines in some ways, in some ways, of Emmanuel Macron. What's behind this sudden new, uh, new model? I think people in Austria were looking for an alternative and found it in a very young man who uh, was working on the political sphere for the last years as a foreign minister as well and, and did quite a job that was acceptive to people. Then he moved on uh, with his uh, um, uh, populist rhetoric using also the refugee crisis in Europe in about four, two years ago, 2015. And I have the feeling that many Austrians um, answered the loss of control with her vote, voting a lot also not for only for the Conservative uh, People's Party, but also for um, the right-wing populist uh, Freedom Party. Ulrike Hermann, Sebastian Kurz, as uh, both uh, other guests have mentioned, took his party distinctly to the right with rhetoric that in some cases echoed what we've heard from the right-wing populists, the Freedom Party. But 
Still, it's puzzling. Why are Austrians suddenly susceptible to this message? This is a country that is prosperous, that has near full employment, and which, in 2015, stood firmly at the side of Angela Merkel as one of Europe's most open and welcoming countries during that wave of migration. So, what's happened? Well, I think basically uh, Austria has always had a very strong populist and right-wing movement since back to the 80s. So in a way, it's just more of the same. It's not a radical change, as you might think. But also, I think that in whole of Europe, not only in Austria, you have two issues that are really uh, burning and that people care about, and it's all about security. One uh, issue is internal or security, so about borders that were suddenly opened, that should be closed, that should be controlled. And the other uh, issue that is almost or even more important is social security. Uh, it is true that um, Austria has full, un uh, full employment, more or less, but many people nonetheless have this feeling they might lose out. You have full employment, but the um, wages are not really rising. You have a, a country with high growth, but hardly anything is, is somehow uh, uh, reaching the uh, uh, employed um, or employees. So I think, and that's something the um, uh, Freedom Party talked about and tried to, to somehow uh, gain votes with. They, for example, proposed that there should be 1,200 euros for every uh, retiree who had been working for 40 years. And that shows that there is an issue about social security also in Austria that is not really addressed, or was not addressed by the Social Democrats. So they left uh, the door wide open for uh, the other parties. Matthew Konicic, what do we know about the Austrians who voted for that right-wing party, for the Freedom Party? To what degree are they truly threatened by immigration in any real sense? Are they losing out, perhaps, on housing, on jobs, because of the wave of migration? Well, most of them are not and never will. But as Ulrika says, there is this sort of fear of what could come. And I think that's really, you know, at the base of this, not just in Austria, but in other countries. There's this sense that there's so many people coming in. They're going to take our welfare away from us. Our future uh, is uncertain. Our children's future is uncertain. One interesting uh take away from the Austrian election, talking to voters afterwards, they did some surveys and they found that I think two thirds of Austrians were pessimistic about the future. They thought that their mm. children would have a tougher time than they did. So this is really one of sort of the classic reasons that people would vote for a party uh, like, like the Freedom Party. I think, to, to intervene here, I think the Social Democrats didn't really come up with alternatives during yeah, this electoral campaign. Austria is not a, uh, a country that is per se against immigration. Austria is an immigration country, was, was always since the Habsburg times and the uh, KUK monarchy. A lot of Austrians are coming from Hungary, are coming from the Balkans. This is um, uh, the, this, it's, it's in genes, it's genetic for, for this society. Which means for me that it's not so easy to say, okay, they are just against uh, Islam, they are just against foreigners. No, the, the leading uh, politicians in Austria did not find an answer for uh, the questions of the people during that campaign, in my opinion. Let's take a closer look uh, by comparing the two young politicians uh, I mentioned uh, at the outset of the program, namely Emmanuel Macron and Sebastian Kurz. The Austrian result came as a surprise to many Europeans who thought that the French election had stopped the rightward drift in Europe in its tracks. In fact, Vienna and Paris are taking very, very different approaches when it comes to migration. So let's take a look. They're both young, ambitious and smart. Austria's designated Chancellor Sebastian Kurz and French President Emmanuel Macron. Both have promised to bring a breath of fresh air and have started their own political movements, En Marche and the Sebastian Kurz List. But their approaches to right-wing populism are very different. Sebastian Kurz owes his rise to the refugee crisis. With his hard line against migrants and his isolationist policies, he's co-opted the biggest campaign issue of the right-wing populists. And that strategy allowed his party to emerge victorious from the elections. Emmanuel Macron, on the other hand, won the presidential election in France with a decidedly pro-Europe agenda and a profile that clearly defined him in opposition to the right-wing populists of the Front National. 
Inclusion or exclusion? What's the best way to keep right-wing populists in check? Ulrike Hermann, let me put that inclusion versus exclusion question to you because it is, in fact, one that's also being debated uh, very uh, adamantly here in Germany. Should politicians take the rise of the right as a reflection of legitimate concerns about the destabilizing effects of migration and adjust their policies accordingly, or should they, in essence, draw red lines? Well, if you look at Macron, he, he seemingly, he uh, drew red lines, but in reality, he also is uh, very much against taking refugees. For example, he said that uh, France would take 20,000 refugees in two years. That is nothing. So he, he claims to be different from uh, Le Pen, and he is, but nonetheless, when it comes to immigration, he is catering to the voters of Le Pen. And uh, I think that's the same is true of the uh, Social Democrats in Austria. They were also very much against refugees, all, uh, already trying to somehow uh, uh, to adapt to the voters that were on the right side. And we shouldn't be uh, too optimistic about Macron, I think, because if he does not succeed to bring economic growth to France, and I think he will not succeed, then in the next election we will have Le Pen. This, this is just, you know, the la this is just the last chance for Europe. We shouldn't be too, uh, <laughs> too carefree about the success in uh, France. So the possibility that France's own right-wing party, the Front National, might in fact come it, roaring uh, back yeah. yes, uh, exactly. if Macron's reforms uh, are not uh, accepted by the population. Matthew Konnichik, it's unclear still what form the next government in Austria uh, will take, but we could well see this right-wing party, the Freedom Party, entering a governing coalition led by Sebastian Kurz and his Conservative Party, the People's Party. If that occurs, will Mr. Kurz really be able to contain the Freedom Party by essentially adjusting a bit to the right? Or might it wind up co-opting him rather than the reverse? I think he will succeed because of the amazing support that he had in this election and that he has within his own party right now because he really did refurbish this party around his own uh, person and change the name even to the Sebastian Kurtz list and so forth. So I think that he has an advantage there. He also has the other advantage that generally his ratings in the uh, population are extremely high, much higher than his counterpart at, at the Freedom Party, Heinz Christian Strache. So I think that he has that advantage. On the other hand, the Freedom Party has been in a government with Kurtz's party before from 2000 until uh, 2007 in various iterations. And during that time, the, the People's Party really managed to put the Freedom Party in a box, and it kind of led to that party's destruction. And so Mr. Strache is very concerned that this kind of thing could happen again. Uh, so he's already said he's not going to basically always follow the lead of the People's Party. He's not going to dance to their tune. He's going to stand up for uh, his issues, and we'll see. So it could come to some uh, very interesting situations. Can I just them. ask you, what are his issues? Mr. Strache <laughs> himself claims to have changed his stripes and is now saying, for example, that his youthful contacts to neo-Nazis were simply uh, uh, the madness of youth. Um, right. Do you think, can we buy that? Has he really somehow moderated or is he a wolf uh, in, in uh, sheep-like clothing? Yeah, I th probably I would say the latter, definitely. And if you look at the rhetoric during the campaign, his use of anti-Semitic innuendo, for example, in campaign events and in debates, there's no question that this party uh, is part of the far right when, you know, maybe even the ultra uh, far right, a lot of the leaders of the party were uh, members of these uh, nationalist fraternities in Austria that have a much more kind of German nationalist tendency. So I don't think there's any question about where this party stands, but they have tried to broaden their appeal with things that you might normally associate, it, uh, associate with the Social Democratic Party by suggesting, you know, more welfare payments for the elderly, more help for workers, more education support. And that really is the core of their program. And these are things that are not that controversial and at the same time uh, bring a lot of people in. Frank Hoffman, if we think back to the year 2000, just mentioned by Matthew Konichik, that was also a moment when the Freedom Party, the right-wing party, entered into a coalition with the Conservatives. Uh, and 
In fact, there was a cry of outrage all across Europe. 14 EU states imposed sanctions on Austria. Now, there's barely a peep. And in fact, we, he, the, the Social Democrats in Austria have not ruled out themselves uh, entering a coalition with the Freedom Party. What's going on? I have the feeling that the uh, Freedom Party moved more to the centre. They uh, tried to um, uh, get rid of people and, and positions that are extremists and far right. Of course, there was a uh, um, few arguments in TV uh, discussions also where anti-Semitism was lying under the surface. But I think they're eager to, to leave it there and not bring it up uh, like before. That's one point. The other thing, if I may, I would like to, to come back to Rike Hermann, who just said that uh, this is our last chance in Europe. Uh, I, I disagree here. I think this is the biggest chance for what Europe has now uh, to, to change the system, to change the bloc towards more integration, towards more Europe with these societies and these countries that want to move forward. OK, let's come back to that in just a moment. I saw Ulrike uh, shaking her head rather vigorously yes, there. Yes, I uh, think when... that it's not true that the Freedom Party moved uh, to the centre. It's a very right-wing party and that hasn't changed. I think uh, the change came in Europe because uh, the sanctions against this first coalition between the uh, People's Party and the Freedom Party from 2000 to th 2006 when the sanctions were uh, decided uh, by the European Commission proved to be... Uh, a disaster because uh, nothing changed in Austria. Uh, instead, everyone was uh, um, more in favor of the Freedom Party than before because the Austrians had the feeling that their country was attacked by Europe. So this time, uh, people just don't discuss about sanctions anymore because it was obvious that the Freedom Party was strengthened by this aggressive act and not uh, subdued. So this time, People just hope that everything will be uh, fine in uh, Austria in four years because one result could be that uh, this coalition again uh, doesn't bring any results for the voters. It's just a lot of talk about enemies or about refugees, but nothing uh, happens so that the Social Democrats be could become very strong as an opposition party and then rule in the next four, uh, after four years. I think that's the hope in Europe. Given the fact that concern about the future in general and about migration in particular are by no means isolated to Austria, let us now look at what the Austrian election result could in fact mean for the rest of Europe. Sebastian Kurz and the Austrian Freedom Party would like to limit the number of refugees admitted to zero. That's a de facto revocation of the country's asylum law. Both are pushing for permanent border checks around Austria. That's a clear break with Europe's open borders policy. Kurz is sympathetic to members of the Visegrad group, such as Poland and Hungary, and their anti-migration policies. That could make a fair distribution of refugees within the European Union more difficult. Austria could also block EU sanctions against members of the Visegrad group. Kurz and the Austrian Freedom Party see the autocratic Vladimir Putin mostly as a trade partner, so they want to ease sanctions against Russia. And they want to allow more popular referendums, possibly even on the euro and the EU itself. Does the election in Austria represent a setback for Europe? So let me get Matthew Konichig and Frank Hoffman to duel it out a bit now, uh, because your opening statements indicated rather contradictory views on what this means for the EU going forward. So Frank Hoffman saw some potential for strengthening of core Europe, and you said you thought the Austrian result could well halt the process of integration and halt Mr. Macron's uh, push. So perhaps, Matthew, go first with that more pessimistic view, and then we'll uh, give well, Frank a turn. You know, I mean, but this is really the core question. It's pessimistic depending on where you stand on the issue. I think a lot of people, even in Germany, would say we like the EU as it is. We're not anti-EU. We like the free market. We like the euro. We want to keep things as we are. What we don't want is to shift more sovereignty to Brussels. Now, this would be the position also of the People's Party in Austria, of Sebastian Kurz's party, as well as the far-right uh, Freedom Party. It's also the position of most of the Central and Eastern European countries, if not all of them, who uh, are really enjoying the freedom that they won after the Berlin Wall fell down uh, in 1989. And they are not as eager to shift their societies into this larger sort of European uh, amalgamation. 
and uh, don't want a more federal Europe. They like what they're getting now. And I think that the Austrian election could strengthen that bloc because Austria is a, a net payer, for example, into the EU budget. It is a Western European country. And I think with Sebastian Kurz, who is becoming a very prominent figure in European politics as well because of his recent success and his youth and all the rest of it, I think they could have somebody who uh, is taking this message uh, to Brussels. So you could see this block, if you will, acting as a kind of break to the kind of Macron uh, visions that we've seen propagated recently. But I also think, just one last point, I don't even think that what Macron wants, I don't think that Germany will be able to go along with it in the end. I don't think that Angela Merkel will be able to go along with it in the end because I think it's very controversial within her own conservative bloc, especially uh, in Bavaria, where the sister party to Merkel's party, where many people also want to have this Europe of the regions, as they call it. They don't want to shift everything to Brussels. Frank Hoffman, please address uh, the arguments you've just heard. But also, couldn't we argue that Austria, if it positions itself closer to those Central Eastern European countries, might even play a mediating role that would allow for a reintegration of these different blocks? Possible, but, but then a lot of these Central Eastern European countries will have to change their policy towards Europe and to join again um, the, 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 the way and the policies of, um, of good arguments and, and the sheer necess necessity in the bloc. I have the feeling that a reaction to these elections in, in Austria will be that, there will, that we will have more Europe in a couple of years' time. I think a bloc, a core European group, will integrate further as a reaction also to what happened in Central Eastern Europe. Austria's most important neighbour, Hungary, for example, is suffering because his politicians, his elites, Mr Orban, the Prime Minister, is, a prop, is, is, is uh, arguing with less Europe rather than with more Europe. If we shift back to the financial crisis, that time Hungary was a candidate for the euro. A lot of people invested and, and got credits in euro currency and after that they had a lot of problems to pay, pay back their mortgages. This is one reason why he won a lot of uh, he won a lot of votes and he won the latest elections. Means less Europe is suffering, it brings people to suffer rather than uh, more Europe. And I think this is one reason why a group of core European countries will create a kind of a stream where others either will, will follow or we really have a, a, a situation where for a longer period of time we have different speeds on the, in the block. So, Ulrike Herrmann, you get to be a tiebreaker here. That idea of a Europe of different speeds has been uh, debated uh, very intensively for a, a couple of years now. But can there really be different speeds on immigration? The European Court of Justice, for example, has just rejected a challenge from Hungary and Slovakia to EU refugee distribution quotas. If Austria also tries to balk at taking more refugees, mightn't it wind up also getting a reprimand from the EU Yes, but, but I think that, uh, and I agree with Matthew here, I think the refugee issue is decided in the sense that no country in whole of Europe wants to take any more refugees. That is also true of Germany. Germany. And I think that uh, any European country, uh, no matter which, doesn't want to have more integration towards Europe. That's even true of Germany, and that's also true, let's say, of the Netherlands or Belgium. Uh, so, um, so what about Mr. Macron's proposals? Uh, uh, dead he, in water? Yeah, unfortunately, I'd say he doesn't stand a chance. What will happen is, of course, that, uh, you know, the one thing is the pro uh, programmatic idea of Europe. That doesn't have a chance at the moment. On the, at the other hand, you know, there is the sheer necessity of working together. For example, if there was a recession, uh, an economic crisis, of course, suddenly everyone would, would start uh, investing on a European scale. So the programme that Macron suggests would become reality. But not because you think uh, uh, or believe in a, a great Europe, but just because it's... Uh, Necessary. So not vision-driven, but Which pragmatic. Yeah, exactly. um, let me just ask all of you, because we are getting close to uh, the end of our time, to come back to the title question that we posed at the beginning. Do you see the Austrian election result and the possible formation of a coalition there as a threat to Europe? Matthew Carnegie? I think it's a threat to the Macron vision, not necessarily a threat to Europe per se, but a threat to this idea that Europe needs to be much more closely integrated than it is now. I think it will empower 
uh, the Macron vision in Europe and uh, we will move on towards a more integrated continent after that. Yeah, it is a danger because many conservative parties will copy this idea that Kurz had, that you just uh, uh, copy the program of the right uh, and then uh, win elections. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us and thanks to all of you for tuning in. See you soon.